Oh Lord, we ask that uh, together we ask that you would bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, that they would be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. This morning we are uh, beginning a new sermon series. We're going to be looking at the book of Amos. And before we dig into uh, the text that we're looking at today, which is just going to be two verses, I want to say a little bit about the book of Amos to put it in some context for us. You might know that um, Amos was written during a period of time when the kingdom of Israel is divided. We've got one kingdom of Israel, 12 tribes, but then in 1 Kings 12, the kingdom gets split apart. Ten of the tribes go to the north. And we call that still the nation of Israel. And two of the tribes remain in the south, and that's where Jerusalem is. And and that nation we call Judah. So we have two separate kings and a divided kingdom at this time in which Amos does his prophecy and also even when Amos writes these, these words down. It happens because this person in the north becomes a usurper king, uh, takes these ten tribes out of the kingdom, and actually begins by setting up two uh, Canaanite temples, uh, uh, false temples to false gods. Now, by the time Amos writes, it's been 150 years since the kingdom was divided, and so all of those false temples and all that idol worship happening in the north has just gotten worse and worse. And so the book of Amos deals with these problems that are happening in the northern kingdom. Amos, though, is not from the north. He is from the south. And so Amos, who lives kind of near the border, he's from a town called Tekoa, which is 12 miles south of Jerusalem, and and Jerusalem is near the border. So he's not too far from the border, but he travels across the border as an outsider, comes into the northern kingdom to give them these warnings about how horrible their behavior is, and also preach sermons to them and give them visions. And then in the very end of the book, we get this very small but incredible glimmer of hope and mercy that Amos brings. So that's the context of of Amos, and we're sure about that because Amos tells us right away like who the kings are. It's King Uzziah is in Judah, and King Jeroboam too is in the northern kingdom. Amos mentions an earthquake several times in the book. We'll even hear briefly about that earthquake in just these, these opening verses this morning. It's an earthquake that Zechariah also mentions, so we know exactly when Amos was written and we know what was going on. Now, if you know Amos, you probably have heard the idea that Amos is a poor shepherd. And that is a slight possibility, but it is more likely that Amos was a sheep raiser, that he was actually the person who wasn't shepherding the sheep, but owned the sheep and dealt in their wool and maybe even traveled around selling the wool that they produced. And Amos also, we read later in the book, had another business. He was a sycamore tree farmer. So we don't know that Amos was poor. People have just guessed that because Amos goes and preaches uh, 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 about justice for the poor in the north. And so there's been this assumption that Amos was poor because he's advocating for the poor. But Amos may well have been uh, a, a wealthy person. He was also, you know, we picture prophets is like these old men with beards and canes, but Amos was probably a young man. So we have Amos, who's this business owner, but he is not trained as a prophet. He has no formal training whatsoever, and uh, and yet God calls him, and he goes to the northern kingdom to bring these messages, and that is uh, what Amos is about. Now, there is a main theme that we cannot escape in the book of Amos, And we'll get to that in a moment. But first, let's hear the word of God from these first two verses from the book of Amos. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, when he saw, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel two years before the earthquake. And he said, 
The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds wither and the top of Carmel dries up. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You might have noticed in that first verse that it says that Amos saw the word of the Lord. It says these are the words of Amos, then tells us who Amos is, and then it's the verse says, which he saw. We don't ever talk like that in English. We don't talk about seeing words. We might say that we read words, but usually we would say that we hear the the words, and that's kind of what we picture happening to Amos in this verse, but instead it says that he saw the word of God. In Hebrew, this is not weird at all. The word for saw, it means like he perceived, he understood, that Amos comprehended the word of God. And we don't have any details about how that happened. It could be that it was over a period of time. It could be in some kind of comprehensive way that Amos perceived the, the word uh, of God, but he did. And that's what matters to Amos in this verse, just that Amos saw and understood the word of God. By saying it the way that he does, he assumes that it is not at all difficult to see the word of God. In fact, in verse 2, God's word is is likened to a roar, a a lion-like roar that comes from Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem. And then he repeats that and says, God's voice comes from Jerusalem. So God has this roar and this voice, and Amos sees it. A lot of times we'll talk about this, we'll, we've kind of popularized this notion that God is just a still small voice and that comes from this encounter Elijah has with God and, and so that's certainly true that God can be a still small voice but here in Amos and it, most of the time in scripture there is no guesswork involved whatsoever. Amos' message here is not try to look for God's voice, work hard to see God's voice. Amos' message is just here is God's voice, see it and obey it. For Amos, God's word, seeing God's word is the supreme authority. God's word is the basis for everything that Amos believes. Anything else other than seeing God's word to base your life or this message Amos is going to bring or, or, or a, a standard for behavior, to base anything else, uh, uh, to, to base any of that on anything else than seeing God's word would be wrong for Amos. And that's what ha- is happening in the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom has three major problems. They are worshiping idols they are materialistic, full of greed, and worst of all, those, those first two things are leading to the oppression of the poor. People who are living in debt slavery and have no legal representation, and so they cannot get out of their circumstance. It is a completely unjust situation. And Amos goes to the north to to, uh, preach against it, to give them warnings that this is not what he has seen in God's word. The north is basing basing all of their judgments and behavior on those things instead of seeing God's word. But Amos comes and says that he sees God's word and then there is a result for Amos because he has seen God's word. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at these words. We are going to be seeing these words that Amos sees. He writes them down, and we can see them just as clearly as Amos does. There are no secrets. It's not hidden. It is going to be plain as we go through this sermon series. And as we see God's word, it is going to affect us. It affects Amos, it affects the northern kingdom, and it has affected people who have gone to the words of Amos ever since, and we are going to be affected by it as well, because we see the word of God, and that supreme word guides us in every way and changes us. 
One of the first things we notice, especially when we step back and we look at the whole book of Amos, we notice that seeing the word of God the way Amos does shows us justice. That is, in fact, the chief theme in the book of Amos. The word in Hebrew for justice is mishpat, and it means uh, taking actions that create fair relationships between people, especially people who have social differences. That's Amos's chief theme. So he sees the word of God and then he goes and he preaches and he teaches about justice and how to create this fairness between people. But the question then is, who decides? Who decides what justice is? Who decides what those fair relationships look like between people? Well, for Amos, it is not complicated. It is not hidden. God decides. God's word defines what justice is. In fact, justice is one of God's chief characteristics. It's part of who he is. And so that is how we define justice. It's how Amos defines justice. God is the supreme justice. It is God's word, the word we see in Amos, and there are other ways we see it too in other scriptures and one another through the church. There are lots of ways we see God's word, scripture being the best and most reliable, but because of God's word, we're affected, and one of those ways that we're affected is that we see justice in a new way. Kathy and I, uh, this week, watched the movie Harriet. I don't know if any of you have seen that. It's a movie about Harriet Tubman. I I think it's pretty recent. I'm not sure when it was in the theaters, but it just came on Amazon, so we watched it uh, this week. And there is a scene in this this movie, you know, Harriet Tubman establishes this underground railroad to uh, rescue people in slavery from the south uh, going toward the, the north. And there's a scene in the movie where there's a pastor preaching from the porch of a plantation. So you have the slave owners on the porch with the pastor, and the pastor is preaching to people in slavery. And he, as he preaches, is talking to to the people in slavery about slaves obeying their masters. And as far as the, uh, the slave owners know, this, this pastor is supporting them is using the word of God actually to oppress people in slavery. That's what the slave owners think because they are only seeing a very tiny part of God's word. They're not understanding it properly. They are not seeing the word. But this pastor does see it. And the people listening sees it. Because later in the film, we discover that this same pastor is using the basement of his church as part of the um, uh, Underground Railroad to rescue people, to bring them to freedom. That's the net result of seeing God's word in that context. It doesn't bring oppression. It brings freedom. It brings justice. Martin Luther King certainly used scripture. We all know the impact that scripture had on the civil rights movement in this country. And Bishop Desmond Tutu writes this about seeing the word of God. And when we see the word of God, it subverts injustice, Desmond Tutu says. This is what he writes. He says, there is nothing more radical, nothing more revolutionary, nothing more subversive against injustice and oppression than the Bible. If you want to keep people subjugated, the last thing you place in their hands is a Bible. God is the supreme justice, and we know what justice is only by seeing God's word. But seeing God's word has another impact on us too. Seeing God's word impacts us not just because of our, a new understanding of justice, but it also shows us a calling 
In our text, these two verses, this is actually Amos's calling. You know, we get these callings where a prophet's going about their business and then God comes or something happens and it calls and we have this calling experience. And sometimes those experiences are elaborate, with, like with Gideon or, or Samuel, if you know those Bible characters. But in Amos's case, it's very quick. Amos just sees the word of God and then he is called and he begins immediately in verse 2, prophesying. We get one verse, Amos is called, we learn about it, there's so much in that first verse. And then immediately he goes and he follows his call. But he follows his call clearly because in verse 1 it says he saw the word of God. So cool uh, today and over the last season, I've gotten to hear uh, some of Betsy's journey as she has been thinking about what, what her call is. She's shared about how she had uh, a sense of cross-cultural ministry even when she was a teenager, how going, being at Whitworth uh, as a college student was involved in the Central America study tour, so having that connection We've had at Hamblin Church for many years now, we've had this connection to Guatemala too. We've sent teams almost every year to Guatemala for the last few years. We didn't, didn't anticipate this result from, from that, but uh, it's been a, a, a process for, for Betsy, a, a journey. And I think that through that journey, she has seen God's word the way Amos does. And because she saw that word, it resulted in a calling. Hamblin Church, same thing. The leaders around here and some, some of you as well have been involved in naming our mission. We want to grow active followers of Jesus Christ and build his community. And then we've gone a step further and, and we've read scripture together, especially um, these six chapters in the Gospel of Luke and seeing how God is working. We've been looking for God's word. And as we look for God's word, we've, we've seen that God is working through this, this journey here. And we, we call it connect, grow, and love. We see people connecting in relationship with one another. We see people growing closer to Jesus Christ. And we see them being deployed to love one another, but also to love the world, to engage the world, to show the world the love of God. It's this journey that we, we have seen together in God's word and, and through God, God's activity among us. And seeing that word has resulted in a call for our congregation. A call not only for a specific mission, but even how we do it. This week, one of the uh, new families that we have around here, I, I had the um, uh, opportunity to, to hear about their connection to the, to the life of this congregation, how they experienced being new around here. And as, as, as they shared this, it wasn't just that, that uh, they didn't use their, our lingo, they didn't say, oh, I connected, then grew, then loved. They didn't say that. But <laughs> as they shared about like who they talked to and the group that they went to and what their kids are experiencing and, and the ministry even that they want to get involved in, they spelled it out perfectly. The experience they had was exactly connect, grow, love. And I just thought, wow, God is really doing this. Seeing God's word results in call, even for us as a congregation. And so Amos sees God's word and it leads to call. Betsy and the, the, the Mo family sees God's word and it leads to call. Our church sees God's word and it leads to call. And so I want to ask you, what do you see? When you see God's word, what call does it lead you on in, in your life? Seeing God's word affects us, shows us justice, shows us call, but it also shows us life. Did you notice in verse 2, Amos starts talking about um, pastures that wither. He says the, the pastures of the shepherds will wither away and the, 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 uh, the, the, the top of Carmel, he says, will, will dry up. Well, Carmel is this mountain range and it's, a very, it's just lush with, with vegetation and it's very wet. In fact, we know that if it didn't rain for three years, it would still be lush. It would be the last thing in the whole land that would dry up. But without God's word, without seeing God's word, even Carmel would dry up. 
Because God's word brings life. God's word brings sustenance and nourishment. We fall into this trap. We think that, oh, you know, we're going to see, when we see God's word and we, we talk about obedience, you know, we, oh, God wants us to do this. We're going to go do it. We think, oh, that's limiting. We think that means we're going to be depriving ourselves or we're going to have this, this uh, we're going to have to give, give stuff up that, that's more than we want to give up. We think that obedience limits us in some way. But Amos says exactly the opposite. Obedience, seeing God's word and doing it, actually brings life. It nourishes and sustains us. In, uh, in that movie, if you remember this one, Gravity, with Sandra Bullock and uh, George Clooney in 2013, it's a story about these two astronauts, and they are out working on the space shuttle, if I remember it right, and there's debris, and the space shuttle gets destroyed, and, and these, these two astronauts head off into space, and they're just untethered, floating helplessly into space, and their oxygen supply is being depleted, and they are dying, and there's this scene where Sandra Bullock is looking through her, her space helmet, you know, and the earth is just rotating like crazy because she's spinning out of control and she can't breathe and she's panicking and you see this horrible fear in her, her eyes because she knows she's going to die. Well, in a magazine interview with an astronaut, the interviewer asked how realistic that was. Would Sandra Bullock really be panicking like that? And it turns out that if you were running out of oxygen, you wouldn't be afraid. You wouldn't be panicking. The astronaut replied, this was a German astronaut, he said, when you're slowly running out of oxygen, the same thing happens as does when you're in thin air at the top of a mountain. Everything seems funny. And as you're laughing about it, you slowly nod off. I experienced this phenomenon in an altitude chamber during my training as an astronaut. At some point, someone in the group starts cracking bad jokes. A person who dies alone in space dies a cheerful death. In other words, your situation is hopeless. You're slowly dying, but you think it's funny. <laughs> the people in the northern kingdom are cheerful. They have everything they think they need. They are worshiping these idols. They have incredible material possessions. They think that they're safe. Now, Amos's message is that they're not safe. And in fact, 40 or 30 years from now, they will be utterly destroyed. But at this point in history, everything is great. They are cheerful. They are dying this slow death because they don't see the word of God that brings life, but they don't know it. They think everything is fine, but the only thing that will save them is the word of God, seeing that word, which brings life. And so I want to invite you over the course of the next few weeks as we look at the book of Amos in particular, but there are other ways to do this. And so I want to challenge you to maybe do this in, in every way, but at least as we look at Amos, I want to challenge you to look at the word of God. It's clear it's going to be right before us. See that word. Because like Amos, like the Moes, like our church together, seeing that word is going to impact us. It's going to impact you. It's going to change how we understand justice. It's going to show us a calling, and it's going to bring life. Amen.